Hey, it's Fan Fantasy here. And some time ago, I did a video on aces and armor and just giving my opinions and thoughts on the first impression. And honestly, I didn't really expect it to blow up, but it did. And a lot of you guys had some good questions and opinions on it. And if you don't know, it is a World War II game that is focused on vehicles. And so in this video, I had the opportunity to interview the devs of Aces and Armor. And we're going to be talking about what is the game about and the development as well as some technical side of things. I did ask you guys to submit some of the questions which I asked the devs. And so I hope you guys enjoyed this interview. It will be chaptered for your convenience. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to check out Aces and Armor on their Discord and their YouTube channel. And if you enjoyed my content, make sure to hit that like and subscribe and so enjoy the rest of the interview all right so with me is alexandros from the dev team of aces and armor would you like to introduce yourself and your team yes yes hello so um i am the manager of the development team at aces and armor and with us in the call we have uh, roberto costa who is a senior developer um and we also have fox who is a volunteer because we got a little volunteer program going mm. and uh we thought It'd be nice to have a bit of representation from one of those guys. Uh, yeah, so that's who we have with us today. Nice. Welcome, guys. Um, so yeah, so tell us about Aces and Armor. What is it all about? All right, so uh, I guess I'll just get started to begin with. Um, so, so it's a pretty broad question, but to, uh, I guess, paint it in broad strokes, Aces and Armor is pretty much a World War II military simulator game which places you as a crew, mem crew member in a truck, tank, or aircraft. Um, and one of the big focus points of the game is that instead of just being sort of a disembodied uh, controller of a vehicle, you are an actual person mm. inside the vehicles. And as an actual person, you are able to get out of the vehicle, uh, you know, fight outside of the vehicle, look around, repair. Uh, I think that adds essentially a lot of gameplay to uh the basic concept of a vehicle simulator and yeah so aside from that it's essentially all of these factors taking place on a battlefield with a significant number of ai infantry and two teams are competing for objectives you got logistics trucks trying to keep their own team supplied you got tanks trying to support infantry you got aircraft trying to achieve their superiority over the battlefield uh, that's, yeah, if I had to sum it up in a minute, that's pretty much the idea behind Aces and Armor. What's the vision of this game? Like, what, what what's going to make this more interesting than the other World War II games out there? So, the, the vision is essentially bringing together some concepts, I guess you could say, gameplay-wise, that historically have either been neglected for the past 10-15 years, or... Uh, basically just haven't really been that feasible due to either technological limitations or, uh, yeah. So in terms of conceptually what sets Aces and Armor apart, it's essentially the bringing together of a few key components, one of which is a large tactical battlefield. Uh, you've got some other games uh, in the genre which are essentially smaller battlefields, mm. though it's got some of the key features. Uh, such as Hell at Loose or Squad 44, but just to use them as an example, you know, uh, an aircraft could probably fly across one of those maps in 30 mm -hmm. seconds to a minute. Um, and that also limits the capability for stuff like flanking maneuvers or, uh, you know, that's the, sort of the, the feel of a wide open battlefield, uh, driving to one location, uh, trying to, you know, go behind enemy lines. A smaller battlefield limits that sort of gameplay. So that's one sort of key component. The other key component is the vehicle gameplay. Mm -hmm. um, you obviously, uh, we know that in games like Squad, Squad 44 and Hell at Loose, uh, one thing which they are missing, I guess, uh, would be vehicle interiors. Yeah. Um, and vehicle interiors, to me, are an extremely uh, important part of you know, gameplay for, for vehicle simulators. I mean, you wouldn't dream of having a flight simulator without a cockpit. Uh, so why have a tank simulator without an interior? Uh, it, there was an interesting thing where, you know, a few years ago, 10, 15 years ago, we had sort of like Red Orchestra 2. We, we had we had games with tank interiors. Yep. And at some point along the way, they just sort of disappeared or became a lot more niche than they used to be. Obviously, we've got some offerings nowadays that still have tank interiors. But compared to the big players 
in uh, in the genre. You know, they're sort of relegated to the sidelines. And the, yeah, so basically the vision of Aces and Armor is bringing together a few core components into one gameplay experience instead of segregating them, which, mm. uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. It also sounds like there's a, a big emphasis on like the details of the vehicles and armor and all that too, right? Yeah, okay, yeah, definitely. So um, as someone who was sunk an uh, insane amount of hours into War Thunder, as have probably a lot of the <laughs> viewers and people oh, yeah. here. Um, I, you know, I, I don't really have like too many bad things to say about War Thunder because I've always been really focused on World War II, and so I stay at lower BRs where it's a bit more fun, uh, at least for me personally. But essentially, what I really, really like about vehicle simulators is depth to vehicles. So you get a certain vehicle, and it's just a gameplay experience you know, in itself. And some game some games have this, some games have this to a lesser extent. Um obviously it's not really in War Thunder's um goal to do that. So it, it's not a point against its favor, you know, it sort of sacrificed that to have more vehicles, which is just a creative choice. So up to them. But um, you know, essentially in War Thunder, WASD to drive, point to shoot, it doesn't really change much from vehicle to vehicle. Uh but if, if you look at games like IL2 Sturm of Vehicle Microsoft Flight Simulator, you will find substantially different gameplay experiences based on the vehicle because you actually have to operate the vehicles within the confines of how they were historically operated. You know, you got to um, open the radiators on this uh, aircraft. You've got to, uh, you know, you got to start up the engine in one way on this vehicle. You got to do it in a different way on this vehicle. You can take off the tracks on the BT7. You can't on the T34. You know, they just. The more depth you add to a vehicle, they create different gameplay experiences. So my idea is that, um, obviously there are some people that are going to agree, some people that are going to disagree, but my idea is that from a gameplay perspective, it's preferable to have a fewer amount of vehicles with a lot more detail than a lot of vehicles with less detail. And that's obviously mm. just a creative decision. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, That that's really um, well explained in that. So... Take us through, if, if I was to load up the game right now and play the game, what, what can I expect once I load up that game? Okay, so, um, so, so some of this obviously has to do with uh, UI elements and stuff like that, which is obviously not completely worked out yet because we haven't done um, But essentially what you would expect is you'd boot up the game, you'd load into a menu. Uh, we're probably not going to go for the style of menu which um, has like the, the vehicle in a hangar um that's probably we're probably gonna go with a card based approach and uh depending on what you're in the mood to do you either go to the mission editor and just you know place down a few panzers few t-34s click play and just go to town in single player uh, set up your own little battle or go to multiplayer and at that point multiplayer segments into two different two different um two different game modes which is arcade and realistic an arcade you can conceptualize as essentially uh, War Thunder uh, realistic battles in terms of how it plays. So you have you are controlling a vehicle in third person, WASD to drive, point to shoot, um, one person to control a tank on a small battlefield with a couple of basic objectives like capture points or yeah, maybe a team deathmatch. And then realistic is you know where stuff gets a bit more exciting, at least for me, which is yeah. um, larger battlefield, uh, infantry, aircraft, and multi-crew tanks. Hmm. And um, obviously, you've got other other people in your tank with you, or AI if you don't have other players to play with hmm. at that point in time. So, so it sounded like you there was single player. Is that is that to be planned as well too? Yeah, so single player is sort of a natural extension, I think, of the... <clears throat> There's no real reason why we can't have a mm. single player once we've got all the game mechanics in place. No no sense in making it multiplayer only. Um, so campaigns and stuff and are not stuff like that isn't really planned. Um, just a, a single player that will allow the player to have some gameplay experiences. Offline, right? Not yeah, like okay. they don't have to be connected to the internet. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I know... Um... A lot of my comments when I did the video, a lot of people had questions about monetization and how that works. So maybe you can go through, you know, what does that look like in Aces and Armor? Yeah, 
Um, so obviously I can answer this, but I'm wondering uh, whether we should bring Roberto Costa up since I know this is obviously something he's interested in in terms of the market, um, market Sure. of the vehicles and everything. So uh, yeah, happy to if he wants to talk about that. Okay. So, of course, everything's subject to change. Um, we will respond in kind to anything that pops up that's unexpected. And when you're dealing with uh, markets, uh, things like that can happen quite often. Uh, the general plan here is that we're going to have a base game, like 15, 15 bucks. Uh, perhaps uh, regional pricing would come into play there because, you know, around the world, it's a bit more difficult for some people to access these things. The reason why we want 15 bucks as a starting price is mainly just as a, a speed bump to stop abuse from free to play because Hmm. you always have that situation of someone creates five accounts, you know, they get banned on one, they get banned on the other. There's 15 bucks. It's just a, a small little speed bump to stop people getting in. Um, past that, we have a premium system. So we have free, free vehicles. These are the vehicles that were widely available, mass produced to excessive numbers. This is your Panzer IVs, your Panzer threes, your Stugs, um, your T-34s, BT-7s, etc. Um, some of them may end up being premium, but there's always going to be a, a core set of vehicles that we build that are going to be free once you have, you've bought the game. After that, uh, we have the premium system. So more rare vehicles, and we want the premium in part to limit how often you see them. Um, these are your tigers, possibly. Uh, maybe not the tiger. The tiger has seen a lot of, a lot of production, hmm. but uh, you know, you get the idea. Less produced means we're going to put it in more likely in premium. And then at the very end of the scale here, we're going to have a limited edition where we only sell a limited amount of them, and for that to proliferate through the community, um, they have to trade them around. And the reason for that is it's stuff like um, a storm tiger, where there's only something like eight ever produced, and we just don't want the situation where uh, you load into a match and your entire team is full of storm tigers. It would mm. be a, a little silly uh, <laughs> for uh, the whole team to walk up to the front, fire one shot, and then spend the next ten minutes reloading, uh, or similar situations like that. Uh, regarding prices, I believe Alex uh, has far more information on this. Okay, yeah. So um, the the prices for the premium vehicles are basically going to be in line with what we're going to see between IL-2 and Microsoft Flight Simulator or DCS, since uh, it's roughly comparable. It, it's not it's not quite as full fidelity as as DCS, uh, but but it's um it's comparable to you know somewhere between IL-2 and Microsoft Flight Simulator. And these vehicles are running depending on their complexity and how big they are from 15 20 dollars to 40 dollars 50 dollars for the premium vehicles hmm. uh roughly in that range so obviously you got stuff like trucks uh, logistics trucks which are far easier to model and make on our end and then you've got stuff like um we're talking mainly about tanks for, for reasons that we're going to get into later i guess but um if we go into aircraft as well um uh, you, you have some aircraft that are going to be a lot harder to model than, say, an Opal Blitz. So they're going to be a little bit more expensive. Um, when you've got stuff like four-engined aircraft with full interiors, that's a huge that's a huge investment of both money and time at our part, and they're going to be more expensive. Um, mm. You know, $70, $75, $80. That, but that's roughly in line with what you'll find in something like Microsoft Flight Simulator. So we're not really reinventing the wheel here. It's, uh, you know the market has spoken we're pretty much just keeping in line with that there are some questions about balancing and and concerns of pay to win like how do you plan on or what do you want to say about about that comment there yeah so <clears throat> obviously everyone's pretty sensitive about pay to win uh, for very good reasons um i have been slightly confused about uh people claiming that aces and armor would be pay to win uh because there is this sort of like nothing within the game's monetization system that could be remotely considered pay to win because uh, things being premium or paid or limited edition has absolutely nothing to do with how good the vehicle is. 
it's solely to do with how common the vehicle was historically. You could have the best tank in the world, and if it was really common, if 3,000 were produced, then it's going to be free. And you could have the worst tank in the world, um, and if one was made, then it's going to be limited edition. Uh, so, the the so I mean, in, in basic terms, it's not pay to win. Um, simply because how good things are is not based on. Um, sorry, how much something, yeah, how how good something is is not based on. Um, whether it's paid or free, it's simply based on historical numbers, and of course. There's another factor to this, which is you will find historically, um, you know, militaries tended to choose the better vehicles for mass production, and they tended to leave the worse ones in prototype stages. Or So um, if anything, you're going to find that, um, you know, historically better vehicles tend to be the ones that are produced more. Obviously, there's exceptions to that because sometimes uh, militaries run into trouble where they have a great vehicle, but they can't afford to produce it loads. But yeah, that's that's mm. what I have to say about that. Yeah, so it's based on. Um, may I... Go ahead. Sorry, I was saying, may I chime in here? Um, because one thing that wasn't discussed here was the the in-game economy. Um, every vehicle you spawn is going to cost your team and you a certain amount of the in-game economy, which is split between your AI general who controls the the whole map and the rest of the players. Uh, there will be situations, of course, uh, despite, you know, our best interest there, where some vehicles will overperform. It's simply the way things are. Um, in that case, we will price them up to make them less available inside the game. Um, there's also the measure of, for every vehicle, uh, there needs to be about five crewmen. So for every paying player, you essentially get five players total who get to use those vehicles. It limits a lot the excesses of any issues that may occur. Of course, we're going to keep an open eye out for any niche cases where things don't line up. Uh, okay. Thanks. Sorry, that was it. Yeah, yeah, and we should mention on that point as well that um, on the in-game economy, we are using the historical production prices as a base to begin from. And like Roberto said, if we get a situation where for whatever reason, a vehicle is overperforming a lot. Um, we have wiggle room within these historical production prices because prices go up and down uh, in the real world. So we can choose between some of these two to, um, to balance in terms of um, how many a team can spawn. Because if you, if you think about it from an economy perspective, um, I think I did the maths a few months ago. I can't remember exactly what the cost was, but just as an example, uh, if you take a, like a King Tiger... A team could spawn something like eight T26s against a King Tiger. And although that might not seem uh, like eight T26s could defeat a King Tiger, if you think about it in terms of a battlefield supporting enemy infantry, which is a tank's main role after all, you're probably going to find that eight T26s are more effective than one King Tiger in terms of um, helping the battle go along. So mm. yeah, that in terms of balance, that was the, the in-game economy. But yeah. Hmm. And the in-game economy is based on the match, is it? Kind of like a ticket system and like other games like Battlefield? So, it's, it's essentially a ticket system. Uh, the only difference is there's the, you know, instead of using the word tickets, we're using the word um, the historical currency of the nation. Hmm. So for Germany, it's going to be Reichsmarks. For the Soviet Union, it's going to be rubles. For the UK, it's going to be pounds. You know, for yeah. the US, it's going to be American dollars. Uh, but it's, it's essentially a ticket system, yeah. Okay. Okay, so it's like the the amount of money on on the game and then it decreases every time you spawn in something, like a Sherman or whatever. So yeah, the, the AI general, who is the sort of guy who's overseeing um, the infantry movements, who's uh, highlighting objectives to try and coordinate attacks or coordinate retreats, um, he basically has a budget when he begins the game. And obviously he doesn't have full control over how that's spent, the, the players do, because they're the ones spawning the vehicles. But the AI general is making decisions based on the economy. So let's just say, take a random number, he spots with 20 million Reichsmarks. I don't know if that's, um, I don't know how much that's actually worth, so take that with a pinch of salt. Um, but yeah, so let's say he starts with that. Um, every time a 
player spawns a vehicle, that takes a little bit out of the economy. Um, and also players can add to the economy by doing stuff like towing back destroyed vehicles, towing back captured vehicles and selling them, and capturing certain objective points like factories will give a small trickle of income. And just while I'm on this point, because it's everyone's second question, uh, what about griefers? We will have anti-griefing measures in terms of people just spawning the most expensive vehicle and then dying. The AI general, if you are underperforming, uh, will basically uh, force you to budget down uh, and he won't allow you to spend loads of money until your performance goes up. So you can't just spawn the most expensive tank in the world again and again and again if you're dying immediately. So yeah, there are anti-griefing measures. Hmm. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about that later on about those systems. So uh, that's good Sounds to good. know. Yeah. Uh, I know we mentioned um, some prototype stuff. Uh, will that be... Um, is that planned as well to be part of the game? Uh, are you talking about prototype vehicles or... Or like fictional vehicles? tanks, planes okay. that were researched, but maybe maybe not fully produced or they were produced, but like in small numbers, like yeah okay so let me find my exact wording on this just to put it in clear uh, language so that everyone is clear on this aces and armor is predominantly focused on real vehicles that saw significant use it's not impossible for an unusual sorry for an occasional very unusual vehicle to be sold as limited edition but we are putting most of our effort towards the more common everyday vehicles used in whichever combat theater so in battle, 95% of the time, you'll be coming up against Panzer IV, Sherman's T-34s, and not weird one-off prototypes left, right, and center. Having said that, um, we are basically giving players a point in time, and we're sort of allowing them to make it their own. So, for example, if there was a prototype tank that never left the US, that's probably not going to be included. Um, it, when you've got something like the mouse, even though it almost certainly never saw combat, you can sort of see it was in the middle of an actual battlefield. Theoretically, there was nothing stopping a crew jumping in it and actually fighting in it. It was a lot closer to combat, in a sense, than a lot of other prototypes. So for that reason, when it comes to stuff like the mouse, a lot of people really want the mouse. You know, we make exceptions here and there. When it comes to, like, proper fictional vehicles, ones that are just on paper, we don't really have any plan uh, to include those. Mm. Okay, yeah, that that explains, hopefully clarifies a lot of questions on certain people's mind on that. Uh, so yeah. speaking of um, development, um, one of the first things that really made a big impression for a lot of the gamers are the details of the interior models and the ability to interact with them. A lot of responses about that. Um, and the question is, will there be keyboard shortcuts to interact with your role in the vehicle like for example uh toggling r for a radio or button to communicate with your other tanks um and all that okay so um yes like absolutely there will be key binds for the most common uh interactions that that's pretty much standard mm. at this point um it would be totally unfeasible to have to look down and press uh, press yeah. you know like the the throttle to go forward or you press the brake to you know you, you the way this tends to go in games like this to take microsoft flight simulator as an example is you bind the most important most commonly used inputs to your your keyboard or your hotas or whatever mm -hmm. such as throttle um brake uh you know, mobility things, fire, aim, all that kind of stuff, get out. You bind that You bind that kind of stuff. And then when it comes to the slightly more niche stuff, which you don't necessarily have to be doing all the time and which you're probably not going to be reaching for in the middle of combat, um, you're probably going to want to keep those as interactable things in the tank because they don't really warrant mm. a dedicated keybind because we all know how quickly games like this uh your keybinds can get filled up oh yeah um so, so it's sort of a healthy mix between the two uh, but That's if good. you want it, it's sort of customizable for you you know you can keybind i like to keep my keybinds pretty pretty minimalistic and then uh do, do a lot of the more niche controls inside the tank but for someone else who wants to do it the other way around it's sort of up to them right 
yeah, like even playing Steel Beasts, uh, the interior models, I'm not going to look down on the Abrams and click on the switch to index another round, but rather use the keybinds. So I can see a lot of people, you know, asking about that. Like, do I have to look out from the, you know, the gun sights to, to do something? So that, that's yeah, good. Yeah exactly. yeah, exactly. Good to know. Um, so the next question is, is there a roadmap or a timeline for alpha early access or release or, or is there an internal roadmap or deadline for you guys? <clears throat> So this was another question which we get a lot, and I answered it mm. in the FAQ. And um, obviously, a lot of people want to know this. The answer is basically that um, game development timelines are obviously completely dependent on funding. So um, it's impossible for us to really give a you know surefire roadmap or release date without meeting our funding goal. The, the idea is is that we plan once we reach our funding goal to draw up a roadmap, draw up some deadlines, because once mm. we have a sort of um, definitive monthly budget, which we have, uh, which we've decided, you know, is enough to support ongoing development. At that point, we can make some decisions. Mm. Uh, but right now, it's it's not really something that you can do with a community funded project before you've met your funding goal. Okay, so we're, right now it's still a little early to say anything about dates or months and years. Yeah. And, okay. Yeah. There are some like smaller, smaller uh, deadlines. Uh, for example, we have a build coming up that's going to be shipping out to a few YouTubers, hmm. uh, such as such as you, I believe. Awesome. <laughs> You've spoken about this um, uh, build with um, tank mobility, driving around on foot, uh, walking around outside the tank. Um, should be some basic tank functionality, like uh, you should be able to interact with some things inside the tank. You should be able to fire inside our terrain, and possibly even. Um, uh, a truck, the Opal Blitz will be in that, depending on whether that's ready to drive. Uh, but mm. we've, we've got that um, coming up. Uh, in terms of that, you know, we, we've got some like rough deadlines, but in terms of the big things like open beta or release, that's uh, a little too early to give that. Yeah. 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 Definitely talking to other, some of the devs, they, it's hard to really give a definitive deadline. And, and you don't want to yeah. rush it either. So, understandable. Another question is, uh, have you taken inspiration from other or current tank games? Oh, yeah, totally. So, um, so uh, yeah, I spoke about this a little bit on the developer Q&A live stream. Uh, people are starting to realize that it's kind of funny, but the initial uh, inspiration for the game came from... Uh, I'm sorry if I can't remember the name properly. It's it's that Roblox multi-crew tank game. Oh, okay. Yeah. MTCC or something. Yeah, I've seen it on my comments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's the, so we were we were playing that, um me, me and a friend of mine, and uh it it just occurred to me that multi crew tank combat is extremely fun. Uh, mm -hmm. even despite the fact that all of the Roblox limitations and stuff, I found it way more rewarding than uh you know, a game where you control the entire tank by yourself. Uh, just the idea of having to communicate with your teammate, you know, tanks not having instantaneous response time, things going wrong. Yeah. It just it just added like a real extra, um, I guess, dimension to the gameplay. And obviously another thing which uh, that game has is uh, infantry. So you got people on foot uh, and that adds a lot as well because, you know, when, <laughs> when you got like a um, guy on foot with like an anti-tank weapon and you're desperately trying to like reverse and show him your front arm and he's trying to run around to the side it, it's it just creates a lot of interesting and unique gameplay experiences and you know having to pick your times when you have to jump out of the tank to repair your engine or your tracks compared to just being able to you know just repair it where you are without having to get out um i think it added a lot of extra a lot of extra dimension to the gameplay. You know, I mean, this is a Roblox game, right? I haven't played Roblox since I was like 12 before that. And I thought it was really fun. Um, so that was like the initial inspiration. And that was late last year. And um, other inspiration basically comes from, uh, as you might expect, the fact that I'm really, really into simulators, uh, like Microsoft Flight Simulator and IL-2. And those are the big inspirations when it comes to the simulator aspect of it in terms of having interiors. Hmm, okay. Yeah. So it helps yeah, that helps to relate like where you got your ideas and 
up what people can probably expect from aces and armor too so that's uh, good yeah actually yeah. actually one, one other thing i want to put in there is um armor three armor Ooh. three um yeah i've been in love with that game for years now i absolutely love it um if if i if i had to really give someone an idea of what aces and armor would be be um it would be something like imagine armor three but there's a bit more care taken for the tanks and the aircraft you know turning them into mm. um simulator and it's set in world war Two. um obviously there are some other differences like you're not primarily an infantry man whereas in armor three you kind of are uh, you're primarily a truck driver or tank driver or aircraft crewman mm. um You'd be, yeah, I think that's the best way to sort of conceptualize um, the way that the gameplay is going to work and the way it's going to feel. Okay. I, have you checked out Spearhead 1944? I think that's their one of their latest World War II DLCs for Arma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was really surprised when they added a World War II um, DLC. That's something I never would have expected for Arma. But oh, yeah, yeah I, I, think it's, I think it's very cool. Yeah. Um, I I think I think Arma Three honestly was like a perfect candidate for for a World War Two DLC. I mean, even before that, I had mods running to turn it into World War Two. That's pretty much all I do. Mm. Um, on Arma Three, <laughs> they make custom missions uh, using using uh, mods uh, to turn it into World War Two. But you know, Arma Three is is pretty old now. Like, uh, when did it release? Twenty thirteen or something? Yeah, um, like I mean, even ten years. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it's aged really well, to be fair. But you know, I, I think it's time that uh, there's a something out there with a similar gameplay experience. Yeah, and that's where Aces and Armor comes in. <laughs> that's the plan. Yeah. So I have a question from a viewer. Uh, he says, "Will the quality of production influence how tanks behave? Like a luck base system, if your tanks got welded well or engine stalls." that factor in so this is this is kind of an ongoing topic of discussion i suppose mm. um i guess me and me and roberto spoke about this a little bit um in terms of stuff like the transmission and the engine in terms of reliability stuff like that uh, roberto can probably talk about this um but in terms of the like the armor quality the welds i think we're not completely it shouldn't be that hard to implement basically in a simplified manner you know basically reducing the effectiveness of certain armor plates on an rng based system uh but it, it's sort of up in the air as to whether we're actually going to do that but in terms of um, like the sort of locomotion uh reliability and you know tanks having transmission problems or engine problems i think roberto could probably talk more about that because he's been working a lot on that recently sure okay so um as we have it set up right now we're going to uh, I said we're going to, but it's pretty much there. Uh, full fidelity in terms of the transmission and everything there. Um, so there's loads of ways you can be a poor driver in a car. Same thing goes for a tank. If you suddenly shift into reverse, you're going to strip your gears. If you over rev your engine, you might blow your engine. Uh, mm -hmm. If you slam the tank down too fast, you're going to break your suspension. Uh, and so many other ways you can absolutely catastrophically blow up your transmission components. Um, we don't want it to be RNG based at all. Um, mm. That's no one wants to be driving around in a German tank that has spotty transmission and then it suddenly blows up. Yeah, uh, it's no fun in that. So it's purely if you're driving poorly, if there's specific components that are a bit more fragile and you don't take care of them properly, you might have an issue. Or you might degrade the performance by stripping a gear or something like that. Mm. And just, just while on that topic, something I have to bring up. <laughs> um, uh, Roberto basically has uh, some mechanical engineering references, obviously while he's been working on uh, while he's been working on the locomotion and stuff like that. And and one thing that just caught my eye that I said I have to bring bring to the forefront, which was um the the panzer like uh, the research into the panzer four likely using asbestos or sintered metal clutches with failure temperatures of around three hundred degrees Celsius. So assuming ten percent slippage on the clutch, the clutch would reach failure temperature after 
uh, like 124.43 seconds uh, or something like at more extreme engagements it could fail in as little as 15 seconds obviously I'm not saying these are like final numbers or anything but I just sort of wanted to bring it up as an research <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted to bring it up as like an right. example of how making certain historical inferences on materials and transmission types you can create some pretty interesting and compelling uh, gameplay experiences in terms of uh, even just, you know, taking care of your vehicle while you're driving it, because if you don't take care of it, you know, stuff like that could happen. So, so it sounds like if you're slamming the brakes too often, then there are chances of degrading your tank in, in this game. Exactly. Okay. Wow. So another question is about ballistics. You know, will, uh, how's that modeled in? Um, will there be factors of Know, hot spallings like an h like an aphe explosive pressure you know shrapnel flying like how tell us more about the ballistics in your game so this is um completely roberto's uh area we also have some pretty exciting news in this department mm. but i'm not i'm not sure if we're actually ready to release that yet uh, i'll leave that mm. up to roberto but uh, this is definitely his his uh area of expertise as well okay so um uh, I assume you're talking specifically about terminal ballistics. Um, flight ballistics, we've gone full fidelity, and it didn't take too much mm. to do that. Um, so, you know, all your fancy extra features, Coriolis, Erdos, uh, Magnus Effect, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but for terminal ballistics, um, we were recently contacted by someone who... Uh, I don't want to point specifically... You know, of course, but uh, he he worked with uh, the with Lockheed, <laughs> mm. um, and we're uh, I'm currently working with him on the terminal side of things to get everything extremely high fidelity, and he's provided us with uh, some very some very nice uh, data and uh, algorithms, etc. On getting that all nice, but yes, things like spall, overpressure. Um, sp specific models for shape charge warheads, um, space armor, etc. Um, we do want to. We're modeling all of that. Um, it's just a question of how we go about modeling it, and I can't comment on that exactly because that's still in development. Okay. Yeah, and I encourage people to to check out that ballistics. Uh, I believe you guys did, did a whole devlog on ballistics that people can watch in detail too right that's still up to yeah date. yeah that was that was pretty early on um we'll probably have to make another one on ballistics because okay looks like we're, we're coming a really long way but uh yeah that's uh that was um like a that was uh yeah you, you can learn some stuff about what we're doing from that devlog it was a few months ago but yeah okay exciting news yeah uh, more to come on that very much so all right so moving along to gameplay, uh, how do you plan on implementing a well combined arms gameplay? I know you mentioned that there is a AI commander, but what about the players and you know how will that work out? Yeah, so um, so this is one of those things where if I really want to give a proper picture, I really have to sort of like take my time and paint the picture. So you have a map, and uh, the map is quite large in terms of the central ground operations area. Um, big enough that it takes a little bit of a drive to get to the front line and trucks have a little bit of a trek to go from rear depots to front depots but just to take it step by step so um, ignoring aircraft for now <clears throat> um, you spawn at a tank depot and in that depot um, you know all your friends can also choose to spawn choose to spawn there as well and uh, once you're in the depot you choose a tank uh, the tank spawns in one of the hangars or buildings, let's say, and you hop in the tank. If you have friends with you, they hop in the tank. If you don't, uh, the AI will get in the tank and you will get in the commander's position. At that point, um, the AI general is basically continuously looking at the battlefield, looking at the economy, looking at enemy assets, friendly assets, pieces of intel, and he's basically deciding uh, what to do. Uh, he picks areas that he thinks should be attacked. He thinks areas where um, he thinks there should be a flanking maneuver. 
he picks um he he decides in certain scenarios like oh this is looking bad we're losing money faster than we can sustain we should pull back and consolidate in this town and you know if the ai general makes a decision like that the uh players will receive a little prompt via their radio if their tank has a radio um and it will also appear on the map something like you know uh, consolidate to this location and uh you know tanks close to that location will do that but obviously it's a front line there are various things going on not every single uh not every single asset is doing the same thing at the same time um so yeah the ai general is highlighting things he's saying things that he wants people to do the infantry are obviously listening to the ai general uh but the players it's sort of up to their discretion i mean they're, they're probably going to do well to listen to the ai general because um they'd be cooperating with the infantry which is an important factor but if they don't you know it's sort of high risk high reward they could they could take a little trip behind enemy lines try flanking maneuver do something like that but the issue with that is um with infantry you know a single man can hide behind a tree and that single man can have an anti-tank weapon uh so so flanking maneuvers this is the thing flanking maneuvers in real life are a lot more dangerous than video games would leave you to believe because in re in video games obviously most of the time it's just a tank uh, that can do you damage and tanks are pretty easy to spot because they're huge but a single infantry man is a lot harder to spot um but yeah sorry uh, that's a bit off topic um so yeah the, the tanks are sort of doing that uh, when you run out of ammunition when you require a repair uh, you're probably going to want to drive back to a tank depot and have it repaired. If you can't drive back because you're too badly damaged, you can try and repair in the field. Uh, a friendly could tow you back to a tank depot if, for whatever reason, that is a more sensible decision to make. Um, aside from the tanks, you've got trucks. So trucks are similar idea, but they're spawning quite a bit further back than the tanks. They're spawning at rear depots, which are basically supply areas where the trucks spawn and then they just have um they just have a pretty generic job which is to drive towards the tank depots and offload all their ammunition and supplies there because the tank depots have a finite amount of fuel and supplies and ammunition so you know that they can run out basically if the logistics uh if the logistics aren't doing their job or if the logistics are getting attacked so the supply thing is really really important players um and ai will also be doing it but players are probably going to be a bit more effective are going to have to drive towards the tank depots and the airfields as well but um and keep them supplied with with ammunition and fuel and supplies uh in terms of are there any questions uh, yeah like uh, um how will artillery work is that controlled by uh the command like the general or is that both a player and a general to call in like a fire support mission. Okay, yeah. So um the artillery is a physical thing on the map. Um obviously it'll probably spawn in different locations each time, so no one knows exactly where it is. You can't just fly hmm. there and bomb it. Um, so, so there's no off map artillery. No off map artillery. Ooh, okay. So you can theoretically disable a team's entire artillery support. But obviously, mm. it's not just the static artillery. You've also got players who can spawn in stuff like the, uh, is it the SU 152? I just want to make sure I get that right. Yeah, the SU 152, which is uh, like a vehicle that has a 152 millimeter gun. And so that, that can function as artillery. So, um, so most of the time, you've got the AI that's doing that kind of artillery, but players can also join in if they want to uh, in terms of where it's being called in. In general duties, the ge uh, sorry, that's kind of confusing wording. <laughs> in usual duties, uh, the general is deciding where the artillery is firing, but players can also call in artillery support, uh, artillery support, assuming they have a radio. Again, some tanks don't have radios, and they will not be able to do that. Um, but it, uh, it's not even necessarily guaranteed that if they call in artillery support, they're 100% going to get it. Because like I said, I mean, the artillery could be destroyed or at that point, the AI general could be overriding that support because it's mm. really, really important to suppress artillery on this particular place. So it's one of these things where we're taking a more realistic approach. So, it, you know, things go wrong in the battlefield. Sometimes things don't go as you want. Um, yeah, that's, mm. that's the artillery. Hmm, okay. Uh, so will players be in like a platoon of tanks or or is that 
or are they all like in individual tanks rolling around like how how does that work so yeah this is an interesting game design thing there's obviously yeah. kind of two options here which is um either players operate you know singular tanks um or you know a group of players or a player and an ai operate a singular tank and players can sort of decide to group together um we will probably also have ai tanks on the battlefield as well just to pad out the numbers a little bit and the question is like should these ai tanks follow player tanks and work alongside them and uh, there's sort of arguments to and fro because it depends how much you can how much control you want to give the player on that because the more control you give in terms of what the player can actually instruct the tanks to do it just becomes a lot more complicated it becomes mm -hmm. a lot more behaviors that we have to code into the ai um th th this sort of thing so um it's so, so at a bare minimum the ai tanks will you know they're not just going to be oblivious as to your existence the the plan is that the ai sort of works alongside you um, in terms of like platoons that that's probably going to be up to the players if mm. they want to stick in groups which they probably will to be fair that's that's pretty standard for kind of like mill sim games yeah so so will it be like squad where they can just um create a like a i guess a squad and then the all their friends can join in that and then they'll have their own group is that how it's going to work out in terms of the ui uh, not exactly because um in squad obviously you've got a limited amount of people that can join like a preset amount of tanks yeah in in aces and armor it's not really the same system um there is no limit to the amount of like tanks that can be spawned every single person spawns as a character in a tank depot and they can spawn whatever tank they want um in terms of getting into the tank uh players friends spawning at the friendly depot they're gonna you know try and get into the tank we'll probably give the owner of the tank a small prompt like do you want to let fan fantasy into the tank and you say um yes uh, and then some random guy tries to get into your tank and maybe you don't want him to because he's griefing or something and you say no i don't want to let him into that into the tank um so that's essentially how that's going to work um obviously for enemies you're not going to get that prompt so enemies can hijack your tank <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, uh so will there be i know there's in-game radios but is there like a local voip that people can communicate or yeah so obviously um we were already going to have an in-game uh voice chat system for the radios and a lot of people have asked for that to also be uh for, for there also to be a proximity chat mm. and i mean yeah no real reason why we can't do that uh, people seem to want it a lot so it makes sense it's kind of funny to be talking to your enemies and stuff but yeah 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 and, and grieve them um yep yeah so uh i know you mentioned about repairing your tanks and all that uh but will there be moments where you cannot repair your tank because it's just totally like that engine is destroyed there's no way you can you know repair that unless you place the entire engine there will be irreparable damage so mm -hmm. you're driving your panzer one you get a 152 millimeter shell straight through your engine like i'm sorry but you're not repairing that yeah <laughs> tough <laughs> luck you're gonna you're gonna have to get towed back by someone else the the upside to this is that engines turned out to be a lot more durable than most people think they are they can really keep on running with quite a few pistons um shut out or you know obviously there's certain things like uh if the shells are like uh, welds like certain certain components of the engine together just for like the the molten steel as it passes through that can stop an engine but engines are pretty pretty damn uh durable so it takes quite a lot of damage especially for a tank engine um to to properly disable it uh so i wouldn't expect that you're just gonna have your engine shut out and com can't move like first thing but um yeah like there will be a level of engine damage where it's just irreparable in the field you have to get towed back to a tank depot yeah and, and speaking about towing there is a benefit to that because it 
I guess it saves your economy as well too, right? Exactly. That's good. Okay. Say you got injured in your tank, will you be able to heal up? Um, yeah, like can someone just heal you up, patch you up, or do they have to go to like a, a medical station to get you up? Um, n no, so the, the plan right now is that um, it's probably a similar system to Armor 3 where you've sort of got like one kit and you can use it on yourself or other people. And um, if you go below a certain HP threshold, you sort of limp and you can't really run properly and your gun sway becomes a lot, um, becomes a lot worse. Um, if you are below a very, very low HP threshold, you may become, uh, let's say, incapacitated. So you need to be somewhat revived, I guess. You're not, you're not quite dead yet, but you need to be revived by someone before you can do anything. So th I guess there's three stages to, to the player's HP, which is completely fine, uh, badly injured, and incapacitated. Um, your ability to heal back to basically full health is just contingent on first aid kits if if your if your uh tank crew has four first aid kits and the commander gets badly injured four times and everyone uses their first aid kits on him then yeah he, he can go back up to full health but it's just a juggling act of you know it's a resource you won't you haven't got infinite amount of them you have to decide when to use them <clears throat> and yeah when you go back to a friendly tank depot you're your first aid kits will be replenished. Hmm. And how much gore will be in the game? And can that, is there a s scale for that too? Like people can, you know, turn off gore or. Yeah. So, um, a, a lot of gore is not really planned. Hmm. Um, it's, it's, we're, we're, we're probably going to have something like armor three. So you've got like physical, indications of damage to someone you've got bullet holes you've got some blood mm -hmm. but in terms of like you know the the real the, the really gnarly stuff which you see um which you see in unreal games sometimes it's not really a plan for us um it starts to get um it starts to jack the uh rating pretty fast it starts to get pretty um uh, kind of underrated how how much of an effect it can really have on the gameplay experience like a <laughs> you know you're driving along in the tank and you get hit by a 100 millimeter shell you know that would seriously destroy a lot on the inside like it would be horrible to continue driving in that tank yeah um to the point where i genuinely think it would make the gameplay experience a lot worse um mm. so a, a lot of gore isn't really planned some stuff like the possibility for limbs to be shot off is possible because we have such high caliber guns but even that's not <clears throat> not guaranteed it's not a big focus hmm. um okay yeah okay yeah and uh will this game be vr compatible Got a lot of questions yeah. on that yeah this is a big question so yeah it, it is going to have vr compatibility uh, in the sense that you can get your VR headset and you can look around inside the tanks and, you know, in your character or inside the aircraft, but it is not going to have something like full VR handset capability mm. where the entire game is set up so that things are interactable with your VR handsets. That's, that's a huge, huge job, yeah. which is obviously why there are some games dedicated to that. And that's just out of our scope. So no, we can't do that. You, you, you can have VR, but you'll still have to control it with your, um, with your usual inputs. Right, so you can't uh, physically, you know, reload the shell into, into the gun with the VR. Sadly not. I'm sorry okay. about that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I guess I got to brush up my VR because yeah, that's good to know. A lot of people were wondering about VR and especially when you're making a high fidelity game. So yeah, yeah. So another question is: Will custom camouflage and liveries be in the game? And um, are they? Are, is there going to be a histor historical guidelines on those things as well too? So it it depends what you mean by by custom. Um, we'll probably have a similar system to War Thunder in the sense that you can make skins and you can put them in your game folder and you can put them on your tank, but unless they're sort of officially supported by the game, they're going to be client side only. So only oh. the player can see them. No one else can see them. 
uh, we do plan on putting a lot of effort into having a lot of a lot of camouflages um, on on the vehicles in game because I know I know that's a that's something that players really enjoy sort of making tanks their own. Um, I, I think it's possible that we can have some system where, for example, custom uh, community made skins could make it into the game. Uh, hmm. If we really like them, if they meet certain guidelines, they could get added officially into the game and have support. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what how the skins is going to be. Okay, so there will be kind of like a custom one where people can make on their client side, and then there's also going to be the ones provided from me guys. Exactly, yeah. Okay, so speaking about um, uh, custom things, will mod support be be a thing in aces and armor so yeah we plan some of some some mod support in terms of custom vehicles custom weapons probably stuff like you know custom cosmetics for characters as well um so yeah there will be modding support insofar as that the plan should also be that uh community servers will have the ability to have mod packs uh within their settings so that if someone makes a well, <laughs> one of our patrons has been talking about how he wants to make a Star Wars mod pack, replacing all the vehicles with Star Wars vehicles, replacing oh all the guns with Star Wars guns. You get that idea. Yeah. So you know, theoretically, I mean, that would be a huge job. Uh, to, yeah. <laughs> just to clarify, making the interiors for all those Star Wars things. Yeah. I'm not sure how these people plan on doing that, but if they do, um, you could you could have a custom community server with. Hmm with star wars um so yeah mods mods are a thing okay and they can replace models too and if they know a, a bit of unreal things i guess yeah models yeah yeah what when it comes to stuff like um proper like in-depth modding like r custom uh custom skeletons for like non-human uh things or or um like custom ai or custom game modes that's that's less certain um hmm. modding isn't exactly something which we've put a huge amount of thought into past sort of the basics but i think the basics is what most people are really interested in anyway since you can make a big uh a, a, well, a largely different game experience from replacing the models and skins and guns so that is sort of that is what we are saying we will include okay so I know you mentioned a bit of um, community servers and all that. Uh, how will servers work? Is there like going to be a matchmaking system as well too, where you can just click on that and then it'll bring you to a game? How will that so work? So yeah, in uh, in arcade matchmaker, uh, in realistic, there will be a list of servers uh, that you can, you know, join whichever server you want. Because in realistic games last for a long time, so you can join and leave as you want. Hmm. Um, you know, we can probably add a button that just says, you know, join, uh, join a random server in realistic that sort of places you in a match based on the nation you've selected or the vehicles you've selected. But, um, yeah, the main thing is selecting servers in realistic and probably a matchmaker in arcade. Uh, when it comes to custom servers, uh, players will be able to basically in the mission editor when they make custom scenarios they'll be able to upload that to a custom server and other players will be able to join that hmm. um yeah so that, that's that's how that is going to function and how many players are can there be in the game or in the server do you plan on so we've sort of said um at least 64 64 is what we're okay. aiming for um this is all sort of you know, limited on server resources, testing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if we can get away with more, then good. But we're saying baseline 64. Hmm. Okay. And uh, another question is, you know, how will you deal with cheaters, hackers, you know, trolls and people who team kill for no reason? How do you plan on uh, dealing with that? Yes, yeah, so um, it's an interesting question. Uh, when it comes to team kills, probably a similar system to something like uh, Armor 3, if you're familiar with it. If you kill teammates, 
there's a threshold you reach well sorry there's someone shouting outside hope you can't hear that no i don't hear it <laughs> there's all a good certain, there's a certain <laughs> threshold you reach where um if you kill i think it's two friendly ais in armor three all the other ais start viewing you as your threat and they kill you um the fact is is that in a battlefield friendly fire happens sometimes especially if there's something like air aircraft like if you strafe a certain area there's just no telling who you could who you could accidentally hit with that so we're probably not going to be quite as strict as armor 3 in that regard but um that's probably going to be it past a certain threshold um your teammates will probably start killing you if you um if you team kill past that uh when you respawn uh it'll probably happen like one more time uh and when you when you get team killed that time by your own people you're probably going to get banned from that match indefinitely and we, we mentioned griefers to the economy as well how we're going to deal with that earlier and is that also like server sided too if they want to up the threshold or you know if they want to just kick you instead of banning you Oh or is yeah, that... yeah, that could, okay. that could definitely be something which um which could be up to the discretion of the server owner. Hmm. And what about uh cheaters or hackers? Uh, are, do you plan on partnering up with an anti cheat system or creating your own? Yeah. So th this is a uh, this is a sort of topic where we're not really in a position to okay. go into go into much detail yet. There's uh. It's early days still that there's a lot to um there's a lot to look into there's a lot of decisions to be made so mm. we're not quite ready to make a definitive statement on that yet okay sounds good okay i think that's that's all of our questions for for today um alexandros fox uh, roberto do you have any uh, last comments that you guys want to add to this uh well thanks a lot for for having us on and everything uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. That that hour really flew by pretty quickly. Oh yeah. Um, unfortunately, Fox didn't really get a chance to talk because, <laughs> as a volunteer, he, he's um he's doing some modeling, and uh, none of the questions were really about modeling. So, uh, he he was just more of an observer. Uh, in case anyone thought that was a bit, um, how he's just been a bit silent. <laughs> uh, yeah, Alex, do you ask something? Was, uh... What can you repeat? Oh no, I, I'll say I was asking you if you want to say say anything about modeling or. Any comments or any of that? No, I actually think Alexandro said everything pretty clear. As a volunteer, I also learned a lot from from this talk because um, I'm still in the process of like getting into the team, mm. uh, which obviously helped me to understand the overall view of the game. And I don't have anything to add actually, or any questions that I could ask right now. All right. I'm glad you're here. Well, yeah, at least yeah. we've heard Thank him. You. At least we've heard something from him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, we really do appreciate our volunteers. Uh, they've been a massive help, uh, and the outpouring of support we get from the community um, has really kicked this project a lot further down the line than it would have any right to be at this stage. Mm. Uh, yeah, so absolutely. thank you to anyone who's who's provided anything and thank you to people like fox yeah as a volunteer i can say it's like benefiting for both of the sides because um thanks to the team i get into i learned a lot and i have opportunity to get this sense of the game dev because uh, i'm from modern community of postscriptum now known as a squad 44 yep so this is like the step forward to actually doing something <laughs> nice and yeah i guess for those who want to be a volunteer like what's that process like okay so um yeah when we uh when we first started volunteers really weren't something which we were kind of expecting so we started getting people saying you know i really want to work on this project uh and i said oh, i'm sorry i can't hire you and they said no no i want to work on it for free so uh, we set up a volunteer program uh, which is basically we have an input system, uh, initiation system, I guess, uh, for volunteers. So uh, I, I should say we, we are, because obviously everything has a sort of managerial cost. Um, 
we are sort of reaching the upper limit of how many volunteers we really want to take on. At this point, I think we have over 20 people working on the game. So it becomes, uh, obviously, like, adding more and more people uh, increases the managerial, I guess, cost, you could say. So, but, I mean, yeah, what we, uh, if, if someone wants to volunteer, basically just join the server and DM me or Roberto, uh, send us your portfolio, tell us what you want to do, and that is the possibility um, mm. of becoming a volunteer. Yeah, that's, that's really exciting to hear, like, that community wants to support and help you guys, so, yeah, great to know how they can continue to support you all. Yeah. The, uh, the one final thing I guess I wanted to say was about uh, if anyone wants to support this game, obviously it's being community funded at this point because I think I speak for most gamers in the community when I say that I think most people would prefer a game that is beholden to the community rather than beholden to investors because mm -hmm. uh, obviously that produces a lot of um, undesirable results, I guess, for, for, for a lot of gamers. Um, so yeah, if, if, you, uh, if you're really interested in this game and you want to support us, uh, we have a Patreon, which I presume will probably be linked in the description of this video. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the Patreon the response has been quite incredible. Mm. Basically, we're aiming for one, uh, sorry, we're aiming for 5,000 US dollars per month to support ongoing development. That's like the baseline, which we're going for. And we're already, I think 25% of the way there. So, uh. It's it's gone well, and obviously this is only going to be the fifth video, uh, fifth video on Aces Nama on YouTube, and we're already twenty five percent there. Wow! Uh, and we've had no other type of promotion, so it's going pretty well, uh, very well. So yeah, if anyone if anyone is interested in the game, that's the that's the way which we can really make it happen. Because yeah, uh, so yeah, and thanks to all existing patrons who will probably watching this. Awesome. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah, thanks for um, being part of this, and uh, yeah, I'll end it here. So, Ooh, thanks, thanks so much, thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. And that's it for this interview. I hope you guys enjoy this. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave it below. And if you find this helpful, make sure to share this video, like and subscribe, and I'll see you in my next video.